that, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Woody woodman Z, drummer from the legendary <laughs> band. <laughs> <laughs> so, drummer from the legendary band The Spiders from Mars, um, who, after working with David Bowie, has collaborated with a number of musicians and artists um, and worked on his own projects, such as um, his album U Boat in 1977. Tom Wilcox, um, who's a director at the ICA um, and a partner of Counterculture, he was previously managing director at Whitechapel Gallery. And um, Tom is also a musician. Uh, he played in the band uh, Maniac Squat. So thank you both for being here. Just to say, our speakers will be discussing um, the cultural impact of Ziggy Stardust and Woody's trajectory. And then after the talk, Woody will be signing some Bowie posters in the ICA bookshop. So do join us for that. Um, I'll hand over to Tom, but just to say again, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Debbie. Um, Woody, I wonder if we could start um, with talking about your early career and um, leading up to the period um, where you met Bowie and um, uh, how you came to meet him. I was... Uh, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> I... Uh, I was kind of 15 at school, um, looking at, you know, what, what job prospects, and I had a list about that long, and uh, there was a policeman, there was a, ba a bank clerk, an accountant, uh, a plumber, electrician, and it was quite a long list, and I kind of went down it one day and went, none of them, and so I was a bit stumped, and I was playing football. In, uh, I was born in a, an agricultural town in Yorkshire and uh, we used to play football in this yard with combine harvesters and tractors and that and we made a space in the middle of all this and one day I kicked this football and it shot over a combine harvester and, and went behind it and it was about this high in nettles and they said well you kicked it you fetch it so I kind of went through the nettles and was like whoa and, I, and then Behind these nettles was a an air raid shelter from the war, and um, it had a door on it, which I thought was unusual. Uh, and I bent down to pick the ball up, and I heard music. I was like, "Whoa, what's that? There's nobody around here." What's? And I shouted, "What's this?" And they said, "Oh, it's my brother. is in a rhythm and blues band. He practiced in this air raid shelter." And I said, "Can I go in and?" have a listen and then no you don't get in there unless you've got breasts and you've got a skirt on and I was like <laughs> okay that, so that started me on a train of thought <laughs> and uh, anyway two weeks of pestering and they, they said you can go in and watch one number you know I was like whoa cool so after school I went in and it was black in there just one red bulb hung and fishing nets hung on the walls and they had a little stage about this high and there was a five-piece rhythm and blues band squashed together and they played Off the Hook by the Stones and I was just transfixed. I'd never really consciously noticed music until that point and the effect it had on me. I was, I was quite shy um, as a teenager, really, right up to quite being quite old. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, but uh, when the music was on, I felt like I was going like this, you know, which I would never do in a dance or anywhere. But I was actually probably going. But to me, it was to, to me it was major. It was a major impact, and I just went, "That's what I want to do." Um, I went out, saw my four mates, and said, "We're going to put a band together." And the only place in that town, I think, was that I knew about was the Salvation Army had instruments. <laughs> so we went along there and they said, oh, it's funny, we're, we're selling our instruments. Um, you can buy them off us. So we bought two guitars, a bass and a drum kit. Um, and they gave me a guitar and I took it home and I sat for a week with this guitar and it, was, it wasn't it was tuned and it was old and, and I just sat with it every night and went, boom, boom, ding, boom. And they said, rehearsal, first rehearsal's on Friday. So I was like, great. 
<laughs> and we got there and they went, go on then, play. And I went, I can't play. And they went, dun, 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 you know, and I was like, whoa, what are you doing? I said, it's chords, man, you know, these are chords. I was like, whoa, show me. So they showed me an E chord and it just, when you first start, it just, your fingers go under the strings and clink and your nails are stuck and... And it was just, I had it five minutes and they said, you're rubbish. <laughs> took, took it off me and he gave me a pair of sticks. And he said, uh, you're the drummer, basically, or you're not in the band. I said, I started it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it didn't bother me if they'd have said, here's a mouth organ, here's a washboard. It wouldn't really have bothered me. I was like, I wanted to be in a band and that was it. So then this drum kit was... Painted like the same colour as Combine Harvesters. In fact, it's probably the same paint. They just sprayed it with bright yellow. It would have real calf skins on that had been sewn up, and the symbol was round but bent and rivets, and it was just sounded horrible. But I used to sit just playing this thing, and and there was a, I had a little room in this same place where the air raid shelter was, and um, it had a window but no glass in it, so I'd be playing and my mates would be throwing bricks through the window <laughs> and they'd be bouncing off the drums as I was practising, hitting the cymbals, and I was like, no, I'm going to get... And it took me a week, to be honest, to get this hand to do something different mm. to that. It, you know, you go and... Well, no, no, but, and then you stop that hand and you do that one, and you go, oh, I got that one together, but this... And then just one Sunday I was doing it, and it was... T- one, two, three, four, one... I was like, Whoa! And that, that, that was the start, really. Then I, uh, yeah, we were called the Mutations, because it wasn't a pretty bunch. <laughs> 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 Apart from me, you know. Um, and then um, we did a few, we got a gig at the, the girls' school Christmas dance, which was, that was it. I mean, I'd made it, you know. <laughs> there was 2,000 girls and four, five guys in the school. You could have stopped like, there. Whoa, you know. But actually, the drum kit collapsed that night. The stool, f- the, the <laughs> seat fell off, the tom fell off, the cymbals both went <laughs> like that because the screws had gone. But it didn't matter. It was like a bit of Keith Moon, you know. Um, but So that was the taste of it. Um, and then I, I, then jo- I then joined a band called the Roadrunners, who we were the band in the area. Um, and they were proper musicians, really. And I was really the only one that practised in the band I was in. So I got that job, and then we we did a festival, an open-air festival, and the Rats were on it with Mick Ronson, who was the guitarist in the Rats. And I watched him in the Rats. The Rats were like the rock band in the area, Yorkshire, basically. Um, and apparently he'd watched me. We never met. Um, and then the band that I was with kind of broke up and I was working in a factory uh, doing overtime one day and the whole band just stormed in the factory. They just came in and, where where is he? And he stood in front of me. I was like, whoa. And he said, "Uh, we want you to be our drummer. And I was like, cool. He said, you've got to audition though. I went, what? And he said, well, you've got the job, but we've promised another 15 drummers that they can audition, so you have to come to the audition and pretend <laughs> that you haven't got it. So I did that, um, and I replaced this drummer in the Rats called Johnny Cambridge, right? So Johnny, in those days, you couldn't really make it, the consideration was anyway, unless you moved from the north down to London. You had to be in London to make it. Um, it's not really like that now. So he was the first one, really, that left Hull to go down to London, and he was playing with a band called Junior's Eyes. And David was trying to really move from being a folk hippie guitarist. I I didn't mean that derogatory. (laughs) I mean, you know, it was folk stuff. And he was trying to make that change to, like, rocky rock stuff. Um, And the guitarist wasn't working out because he was a bit American country. So John, John had said, I know this guitarist in Hulk called Mick Ronson, who was really good. So then Mick went down, and they did a few gigs, I think, as, as the hype. Um, and then I got a call from David, and he said, uh, Mick says, you're really good, I want you to come down and 
live with us and join the band, you know. So then I replaced John again, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> he was, I mean, he was, a, he, was a, he was a nice guy. He wasn't a fantastic drummer, but um, he was a nice guy. Yeah. He was funny. And what were your impressions of Bowie when you first met him and started working with him? A uh, little bit of a culture shock, because, you know, we were northerners, and we, we lived in jeans with patches on and denim shirts or tie-dye T-shirts or whatever, and we had hair down here. Um, that was dressing up, really, for us. <laughs> um, and I walked in to his place, and he had red corduroy trousers on, a rainbow T-shirt, kind of hair down here, um, bracelets on, red shoes that he'd painted blue stars on the top, you know, obviously hand-painted. And um, I had a conversation with him, and through it I just thought, this guy means it. You know, he's, he's going for it, and he's going to do it. And he's already, he's kind of already there. He's, he's being an artist 24-7. You know, and you notice that kind of everything he did was to create an effect. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. But it was always to create, he was on stage continually. Um, it was always the front of his mind was creating effects on people. Um, and I just was impressed with that. I just thought, well, he does mean it. You know, and then we heard some of the songs, and um, he could write. You know, so you had an initial period in London working with Bowie, and then you um, you fell out, or you had a disagreement, and you went back up to Hull. Is that this is true? This is true. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got we've got an early recording to listen to now uh, that you did with Mick Ronson when you you went up to Hull for a, a sabbatical for a few months before you yeah. came back again. We have Powers of Darkness, please. There we go. <laughs> that was the most commercial we got. Is it? <laughs> yeah. If you've never heard the chorus of that, it's definitely worth it another time. It's uh, great. So, um, and then what, what enticed you to come back and, and, and uh, work with Bowie again? <coughs> well, we'd kind of left, Mick and I. We, we, we had a gig at Leeds University, and David went up in his, I think he went up in his Rupert the Riley car, the song, yeah. And um, we went in a taxi, I think it was. And we got to a crossroads, and it said Leeds, Hull. And um, we'd just been in the studio doing Man of Saw the World. And when we got to the track, um, Black Country Rock, I think it was, he started singing like Mike Boland. And we, for whatever reason, it just, we couldn't handle that. It, the, uh, uh, and all that it was just <laughs> a, a bad we must have been a, it was a bad week <laughs> and we just went I can't go no on stage I can't go on stage behind that I'm sorry you know <laughs> you can, uh, 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 it was just no <laughs> and it really got to us um, so on the way there we just said do you want to go to Leeds or Hull so I think I don't know who said it I can't remember we went Hull <laughs> so we went to Hull and he he did the gig on his own, basically. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. He never mentioned it. <laughs> He's never talked about it again. No, no. And then, then he phoned up a few months later, and we'd, we'd got Trevor in by then, so we had Trevor on bass, and uh, it was sounding better. It was sounding good. Um, yeah, go on. Well, <laughs> well, let's talk about The Man Who Sold the World, because it's, it's an interesting album. It's, um, it's you know, at first glance, a sort of heavy rock album that's quite... Um, standard for the time, but um, yeah. it was it was different in many ways. It had um, early synthesizer sounds on it. It was produced by Tony Visconti, who then obviously subsequently became um, Mark Boland's producer and made that sound work. <laughs> so maybe you thought, oh, this is this is a good thing. I can do yeah. some more of this. Um, but can you tell us about the album and, and the sort of creative process in it, and in particular um, how Bowie, who who at that time was writing all of his songs on an acoustic guitar, how they then became. Uh, these these rock songs that, that formed the album? Well, that particular album was different to all the ones we did after that um, because he had really just done the, the chords, the guitar chords, 
So it would be, well, it goes there, there, then the chorus is that, and then there's a middle bit, and then blah, blah, blah. So we didn't know what the songs were. There were no lyrics, and there was no melody as such. So we went into Advision Studios, and and it, it was really the first time Mick and I had been in a big, a real studio in London, you know. And it gave you a chance to put all the licks, all the drum fills, all the that you wanted to put on record, whether it fitted or not. <laughs> I mean, that was kind of the the process. Um, so we just um, kind of jammed it out and made, you know, where it wasn't quite, didn't sound like a song, we made it sound like a song. And, um, and Tony was a musician, so, he, you know, he was helpful on... Um, he played bass, didn't he? He played bass on it, yeah. Um, he was like a... It wasn't really a, a a bass player. He played bass. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was kind of all over the place. He was. Yeah. I don't know if he could listen to me or not, whether he heard me or not, but it did fit. <laughs> um, and then David came in and put the vocals on. Um, the songs, you know, were, were probably still in the. Uh, Sci very in the sci fi thing, which we like, we were all into sci fi. Um, and there's some you know interesting concepts. And then we got the synth guy in, and he just went crazy on top of that. So it was kind of th everything in there the kitchen sink, you know. Yeah. Um, and then he had the job of mixing it and making it sound like a record. <laughs> Should we hear some of it? This is uh, Running Gun Blues from um, The Man Who Sold the World. Um, so uh, the album didn't initially sell well, and, and one of the reasons I've heard often given is that um, there was a massive audience for that kind of rock in 1971, but the bloke on the cover over the chaise long with a dress on was, a, <laughs> was, was an off-putting thing, and it, 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 it really was quite an obscure album, wasn't it, when it came out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of the first time we saw the... Um, the dress. <laughs> I bet it wasn't. Uh, so, <laughs> moving swiftly on. After after the man who sold the world, um, you recorded. Well, the sub next year you recorded Hunky Dory. Yeah. Uh, and despite the affection that many people have for Ziggy Stardust, I think there are a lot of people who would say that Hunky Dory is their favourite Bowie album. And it's uh, yeah. It's, it's one. One anyway. Yeah. Two. Two. Okay. A, you know. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Definitely a significant minority. Um, could, could you tell us about you know what what changed from the man who sold the world? What were the big differences, and, and why was the sound so different? Because the dress, the, the, basically, the, the dress, dress was it? <laughs> yeah. No, um, I think he'd, he'd been to America and done radio shows and whatever, and was listening to music over there. And um, there was a definite change in the. Ro it was like he was saying, "I'll show you I can write." I can write songs that can cut through, that can get there um, without compromising. Because we never really did um, boy meets girl type songs or love affair. Yeah, there were love affairs, but they were always a bit twisted. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was never quite normal. Uh, and I think he was just out to show, really, I can write. You know what I mean? Um, You'd hit, there would be a piano in one room, and then the, in the lounge you would sit and play guitar, and he would just he would shout, "Woody, I've just finished one. Come in and have a listen." And I'd go in and he'd play one and go, "Well, yeah, that's cool." Um, like the chorus or whatever. And then then he'd be in there doing it on the piano. You'd hear um, "Life on Mars" or something. You know, you think, "Well, it's a bit plonky." because <laughs> he wasn't like Rick Wakeman you know um, but you could hear the songs you go whoa that's that's good so that at that period every, it seemed like every song was good it was just like whoa you know another one um, it was like on a roll you know he'd kind of seen what he was going to do um, writing wise and was going for it 
The role of um, Mick Ronson, who sadly died in uh, 1993, um, beyond that of just being a guitarist, becomes more evident on Hunky Dory, doesn't it? Because he was starting to arrange the strings, play yeah. the piano, uh, play some of the other instruments as well. Can you yeah, tell us a bit more about that? Well. Um, we were listening to a lot of different stuff. We were listening to Neil Young, Crazy Horse, um, a bit of Wall and Bridges, Lennon... Um, Velvet Underground. Lots of different stuff. I remember listening one day to a Crazy Horse one, Neil Young one, and we really, I really liked the groove on it. It was very simple, and it was, it was like, whoa, well, you, you really get into this. Because I'd been one of these kind of drummers, really. Um, and the guy hit the cymbal right near the end of the song, and I realised he hadn't hit it all the way through. But when he hit it, it went, whoa, it was just the right place for the symbol, for that effect. And it just taught me less is more, um, that you can create an effect, finding the right uh, rhythmic groove to bring that particular song to life. So, that, you know, we, we kind of just start to think like that as a band. Um, and we played together a few years before, so we knew each other's playing. Um, so we were listening to a, things with strings, string arrangements on. Um, and there was a guy at the time called Paul Bookmaster um, that we liked what he did. Um, but it wasn't quite rock and roll. Not. And then Mick said, I've, you know, I've got to go back and... I think after he saw Rick Wakeman play, it brought back his piano thing mm. he really liked piano but he, he'd never really carried it he'd, apparently he'd done up to grade 7 or something as a pianist and uh, it turned out that the per, the woman that had taught him was Trevor's grandmother in Hull and we didn't know that <laughs> so he went back to her and she finished off his piano thing and um, and then showed him how to write arrangements and, you know so he which I thought was pretty cool that a, a rock and roll guitarist would bother to go back yeah. and, and re-study um, to be able to do it. Um, I and then because he, was a, because he was a rock guitarist, when he did arrangements, it wasn't like somebody brought up in a classical thing then put trying to sque squash an arrangement onto a rock and roll band. Mm. He thought like a rock and roll player. So the, I always thought the strings and all that were like just perfect. Yeah. I thought you were going to tell me that Trevor's grandmother wrote uh, Life on Mars. But, uh, <laughs> just the chorus. Uh, just the chorus, yeah. Was, uh, <coughs> I thought so. I've always wondered about that. And, and basically, we, we did start to really get into playing the songs, you know, um, from listening to stuff. It was like, rhythmically, find a, you know, find a beat that really brings the song to life because there is one in any song you've got to kind of find it the one that and it could be simple or complicated but you have to find it and then you know how do you arrange that so that the, the song comes across so it was always pushing uh, the song and David's voice it was always done from that viewpoint I mean the album's Best known really for changes, Life on Mars, Kooks, you know, that kind of soft, almost hippie-esque Americana song. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's, there's, the song, there's another song on the album that I think is quite significant, and it, it almost sounds like um, a, a, real, um, a song that really precedes English punk, and that's uh, Queen Bitch. Uh, I can see we've, we've got the, the man who actually invented English punk, Glenn Matlock, in the audience today. So I, I don't want to go too down, advance yeah. that theory too yeah. much. But You've just uh, walked out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when you you know when you listen to this album from 1971-72, um, it, it sounds very much out of its time. So can we hear Queen Bitch, please?
don't think Glenn would agree with you, but <laughs> I think he'd agree that he invented punk. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's for, it's very Lou Reed. It is, it is. Yeah. I mean that we were listening to you know Velvet Underground at that time, and um, the only thing we had against it was they couldn't play. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was like, okay, we we get the the essence of it, the feel, and the. Um, the, just the dynamic of it, the, the degradation that was coming across through the music. So we wanted that, but how can we do that English, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the things you go through, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it had to be, you know, well played, whereas they, we didn't think they played well. Um, and we, I, I didn't think Lou sang well, personally. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Erase that bit. Yeah. Um, this is going on YouTube, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <yeah. laughs> it's tough. <laughs> what um, was the question? I can't remember. No, I can't remember. No. Um, but it's much more the harder sound that you moved on to, to Ziggy. But yeah, that was the start, really. I mean, that track, when we left to go to Leeds... No, we didn't go to Leeds. We went to Hull. <laughs> Um, he'd written that one and we and he gave us it so we were already gigging that one we were playing around with another singer doing that one so we had that one already kind of worked out on what we played so we just went in and did a take and then he put the vocal on I mean he was interested in doing vocals because I'd never I'd, I'd been in studios watching other people sing and do all sorts of overdubs when you you know, put something on top of something you've already recorded. Um, he would do a vocal straight off, just sing it from beginning to end. And I remember one day he said to Ken Scott, he'd just done a vocal and it was like, whoa, that's really good. And he went, Ken, I want, uh, I'll double that one. So he didn't even come up to the control room to listen to it. He just said, I'll sing it again and we'll put them both together. And we, Ken was like, oh, you know, that can't be done. And we were like, and he did it. And it was, you couldn't hear the difference. You know, you could, it, this, if you went under a microscope or whatever the um, equivalent is listening, you'd hear a slight difference, but you couldn't hear it with the ears. And I was just like, how the hell did he do that? He does a great take and then does it again straight after anyway um, and the albums were recorded very quickly weren't they and you, you did Hunky Dory and then literally a, a number of weeks later two you, weeks you went later, in, two yeah. weeks, you went in the, the Ziggy which took a week yeah I mean cause, because we laid it all down we wanted the live feel that, that there's something happens when you're recording that um, you're either you're either in a creative what shall we call it place or mode um where you're in create, like when you're writing a song or you're doing it for the first time, you're trying something out. Um, when you do it the third time, you're you're repeating. So you're not creating. You're, you're repeating it. Um, and it's lost something already from that initial, whoa, that, you know? You go, that was good. And then if you do it five times or, you know, bands that take a year and a half to do an album. Or three years How many years times do they play it and sing it? And yeah, it's going to get more correct and it's going to get more technical and the sounds might be better and it's tighter and it's everything's more right about it. But you're off the point, mate. You've, you know, mm. the point was back there when you got the idea and it was fresh and you created it. And, and I think that was part of the, the sound of uh, those albums. We, we never went to we never went to four versions we never did four takes of it in a studio it would be first usually second if you know if it got to third you were like whoa you know what I mean you were like we've got to get it this time um, so it then made you only go for what you were 110% certain you could really nail and you could communicate with that beat or that bass part or whatever it was can, will this work? Do I know this works? Um, and also, 
you, you know, you knew it was going to be around in years to come. People would listen. You didn't want an embarrassing part. So you as a drummer was thinking, I want a good part, but I want it to sound good. And I, blah, 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 and I don't want an embarrassing drum film, you know, because you didn't really go in and take embarrassing bits out in those days. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It, <laughs> it was in. I mean, Trevor plays a, a wrong note in Gene Genie. And we came up, and, and it was the first take. And uh, we said, oh, yeah, we know what it is now. Let's go and do one. We were, we were like, mm-hmm. keyed up. And David just said, that's the one. And we went, well, what do you mean, that's the one? That's the first take, you know. And he goes, that's it. And we said, yeah, but there's a bass note. And he went, I like it. And that, that was that. <laughs> and it's, it's still in there, you know. Um, so it was that kind of a, an attitude on it all. And knowing that it's that freshness that somehow got onto vinyl, CD, whatever. It got on there, that newness where you're all creating it. On the, you're on the same page, pushing in the same direction with the same message. It's kind of, you've got to be crap musicians for it not to work. <laughs> yeah. So Def Leppard spending three years making one album is the antithesis of that, isn't it? No, Joe's a friend of mine. I know he is, I know. He, he had yeah. a, I mean, they had a hard time doing that. They nearly gave... Phil Collins said to me, I nearly went and... I would rather be a garage attendant than go through that again. Because it took the soul out of it, you know. It was, it didn't was they have a to play every note sound. separately in each chord? Yeah, and, no. rather than hit the guitar like that, they did ding, <laughs> do the next string... And then made a chord up. He said it drove him. That wasn't being a musician. <laughs> I mean, that's the ultimate of that. But it's still that that initial. When you've got it, you've got it. You know it's right. Do it. That's the best philosophy from my viewpoint. I mean, it's undoubtedly uh, the Ziggy Stardust album that took David Bowie from being a, you know, quite an erratic one-hit wonder, really, who'd done a, a real. A uh, really eclectic mix of stuff in the past, and uh, uh, made him a superstar. Um, but if we think about the context of England in 1972, you know, grey sort of drab, uh, re- recession, you know, ev- everyone in jeans and long hair. I mean, it, it, it was it was an amazing thing in the context, and patches, wasn't it? Yeah. And patches, yeah. <coughs> yeah, it was. Um, I guess you know we didn't think about it at the time. <coughs> you know, the, the whole concept was was David's, um, and he had to do a bit of arm twisting to get his, us into some of it. Um, I mean, he, we went to Liberty's and uh, Dickens and Jones, I think it was, for material, for, for costume, <laughs> and it was, it was totally just a Mick and I wandering around going, what are we doing in the shop? <laughs> <laughs> what are we yeah. doing in here, you know, with all this velvet and stuff? And... Uh, and then they'd they got material, then, and then he'd done some drawings in the, in the lounge, and he called us in and just said, uh, these are, these are going to be the outfits, and we were like... <laughs> it was just totally unreal at that point. <laughs> and um, I think there was three colours. There was blue, pink, and gold. And they said, well, Mick will look good in gold, you know. So it was me and Trevor going, who's having the pink then? <laughs> 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 and they said... You know, and they say, well, Trev's got dark hair, he looks good in blue. And I'm like, I couldn't really argue with that. Um, and then I think Angie said, uh, you have to be a real man to wear pink, and I was sold. Yeah. I mean, I was a naive 19-year-old, you know what I mean? So the man was in pink. Did you arrive at Hull Station in your pink outfit? Like, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'm a Mick real left. man. Mick left. He, he, he'd gone. he packed his bags, and he was at the station in Beckham. And... Um, it said to Angie, you can, you know, go away. Um, <laughs> you won't get, I'm a musician and I have friends. <laughs> you won't get me on stage in that. You know, and David said, go get him. You know, whatever it takes, go get him. So I sat on the station with him, trying to explain, even though I wasn't fully convinced. <laughs> but I mean, I, I guess I was really. I could see that it would be hard playing those songs um, in patched jeans. It just somehow didn't go with it. It wouldn't fit. And David had taken us to uh, see theatre in London um, and said, watch the lights. Well, 
like, yeah, all right, you know. And and then we kind of noticed the lighting, and it was like, you know, when there was a dramatic scene on it, it would be that colours and this, and, and I love seeing it would do that. And, and you went, whoa, it really affects... The, the effect is bigger than if it's just white light. And in those days, you didn't... Rock bands didn't take big lighting rigs out. It, or if they did, it was like red, you know, green, yellow, all of them at once. That's the cla- you know, that's the climax. And he said, no, if you if you if, if you use it creatively, it can add to what the song's about and what's being sung and the atmosphere. And it was like, whoa, yeah, cool, you know. So we got into that. Um, so the costumes, I was able to put that across to Mick, you know. I mean, we did do a little bit of dressing up in the Rats, which was the band in Hull, um, um, but it was on a different kind of level. You know, Mick would have Apache boots made, and I used to wear a, a pa- whatever that thing that the Apaches used to wear with zinc <laughs> patterns on and, and wristbands and that. That was that was dressing up, but that was woo. That was far out, you know. <laughs> um, so I had to explain. Well, it's the same as that, Mick. You know, it's just doing that on it. It's a bit different. But it, it, it kind of took a bit of guts, yeah. you know, I think on everybody's part to go, and David's, because um, it was with him being the front man and his thing. It could have gone horribly wrong, you know, back in that time. Mm. It could have been a real joke. D- do you know what I mean? It mm. could, well, the way we looked at it, it could go that way. So you were taking a risk of like, oh, all right, I'll go out in pink, you know. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, did you did you have a sense that you were part of a much bigger thing, you know, an artistic project, a concept, much more than you were just four people making music? Always. No. Um, <laughs> um, I had to ask that. It's the, it's the ICA. You know, yeah. it's, it's what we do here. You know? um, No, you you just knew it was different. You knew it was different, and but you liked it, and you enjoyed playing it, and the 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 group uh, spirit was good. It was it was we had a, we worked really hard, um, but we played really hard, so it was a good balance. Um, and you were doing what you wanted to do. You wanted to be. I mean, when I first decided, okay, I'm going to be a... I kind of got kicked out of school and um, they called me back and said, well, what are you going to do, wouldn't they? You're going, you're going to be a bum, you know. That was their master. And I said, no, I'm going, to be on, I'm going to be a pop star. I'm going to be on top of the pops. And he said, see, you're, you're an <laughs> idiot boy, you know. <laughs> I never did... I wanted to go back to the school, but I never did it. Um, so I always thought... That's where I want to go. Um, and that that weekend when Bowie phoned me up, I had kind of been the musician, and there was no other musicians in my family at all. It was a it was a very northern working class thing, like Billy Elliot, you know, like that kind of thing. But I I'm just not, want a drum but, dad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> across the wall, you know, yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> So it, it was not acceptable, really. You know, there was no real support. And um, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. where was I going with this? Um, what was the songwriting process similar on Ziggy? Where did that did come you know? from? It's on the it's on the paper. <laughs> Is it? Okay, yeah. um, for David. Well, and, and for you, and how you realised the songs from his original songs? How do you mean? Well, in that he would he would again write on an acoustic guitar, and then you would you would make them rock songs. Or was he much more involved in the whole process of it? Uh, no, he would just play it on acoustic guitar. So then sometimes you had to think, Whoa, how how are we going to make this? Because we thought we were thinking live. We have to make it sound like a set, so it has to fit, and it has to be something you can put across as a rock band. So it was always that was always in your mind at the same time as playing for the song. So it was quite a always an intricate thing. But then it became natural to do that. You just kind of knew what to play. And I th- and I think when you got good songs, 
Um, it's not that hard to find how to do it. Do you know? We've got an example of that, actually. If we could hear the um, original acoustic version of Ziggy Stardust. And if we could yeah, hear the... That one wasn't no, far off. That was, that was pretty... Um, you know, sometimes he would get one that, that was a rocky, because he was working with Mick a lot, mm. cause-wise and all that. So some of them were easier to just put a beat to it, really. You know. There's still quite a difference, isn't there? Should we hear the um, album version? Yeah. Try it. <laughs> Not bad. Just a folk band, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You said about um, Mick Ronson helping um, Bowie with chords and so on. Do you think history's underplayed his role in, in making those albums? The silence. Um, yeah, I do. Actually. His sister Maggie's at the back, by the way. <laughs> so, uh... Hey, Maggie. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he was able to. Um, he had kind of a no-nonsense approach on chords and things like that, didn't Mick? He would go, yeah, most guitarists play it like that, but I just use one finger and it sounds louder, or it sounds heavy, I just do that, you know. Uh, and he developed his own sound, really. And have, having been with him through a lot of those changes, it was a, we'd played Hendrix, we used to play Hendrix stuff, Cream stuff, Jack Beck, Jeff Beck stuff, um... And in those days, it, I guess you were like a tribute band that tributed everybody. You did a, you were a covers band, so you learn how to play like those bands. And the, you were a good band if you could make, if you could sound like Cream, if you could sound like Led Zeppelin, and make it believable. So um, your style, you were all the time learning like an apprenticeship you were learning and shoving it in your library in your head you know you had a library back there of all these sounds out to play that what kind of fills go with that beat what what guitar sound what blah, blah, blah. it was in there so then when you had a job to do in front of you you went in the library basically and just had a look around and went oh yeah that's good that'll fit that that's that kind of a thing and it narrowed it down and then you knew it's gone in the library because it works and or, or I like it and it works and it fits that kind of... So when you had to create, you you went in there and pulled out all this... It sounds really um, a bit esoteric. It's not really... I'm just hit drums, you know what I mean? <laughs> I just make a loud noise with drums. <laughs> but that's kind of how you do it. And it, and he was the, he'd learnt Hendrix, how to play like Hendrix. And he sounded like Hendrix. And then he sounded like Jeff Beck. And, he, and it was exactly the same. And then I think he'd got um, a wah-wah pedal from Pete Townsend for a fiver. And, and, um, and he, he cr kind of created his own f sound. If, he'd, if he jammed it, it created a different sound. So he, with his playing, and it, it always sounded like Mick. And he was a, um, he was a tasteful player, you know. Um, I remember we did Radio City in New York. And we, we had an extra guitarist with us for some reason. And this guy was going to play rhythm, but off stage, rhythm guitar, just not just chords. And, um, and he was one of these million miles an hour guitarists, you know, the, the smoke coming off the neck. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> All that. And if this guy, <laughs> shit. <laughs> and there was a lot of press in there. There was for about four rows of press, and they were they were watching this guitarist like this, you know. And Mick kind of walked on, plugged in, and went. Mm -hmm. and all the heads went, and they never went back to this guy. And he was still, and then Mick was just, and he just went, "Oh God, can you feel the difference?" You know, um, it could communicate with the guitar, just the right emotion and the right sound uh, it was not how many notes although he could play that he could play like that but he very rarely did it was always tasteful so yeah it was um, I don't think he really got the credit for what he did and the arrangements were incredible you know when you had when we did Life on Mars and we and um, 
It was amazing listening to Rick Wakeman play it after David had written it, because David was plonky plonk, really. But the right chords, but there was no flourishes and that. And then Rick just got on it and went... And we, we did it in one, uh, two takes, and we all did it live. Um, and then he put the string arrangement on, um, and it was just amazing. Um, and in fact, that, I think that was his first arrangement that he ever did. Mm. Um, because we, we had the studio book for Monday morning, and he hadn't finished writing it on the Friday or Saturday. And he, was, he would sit in the toilet and lock the door and keep writing it. And you Nick, I want to go to the loo. And he was in there. Now I'm still writing, you know. <laughs> um, and then David's mother used to bring us tea in bed on a, on a Sunday morning. <laughs> this is bizarre. Um, that was our only bit of home comfort, do you know what I mean? Um, and he'd finished the arrangement... And he was nervous about it. And he was nervous because it was BBC string players that were very conservative and very didn't like rock and roll anyway, but they were getting paid for it. So it was that kind of an atmosphere you were going to be walking into. And we were we were in we actually slept in sleeping bags on a landing. And she would bring us this tea up. Uh, and he was so nervous about it, and she went Mick, would he? And he shot up and he went, what time is it? And it was, it was like five to nine or something like that. And we were out in Beckenham. And he, and he stood up completely naked. <laughs> she screamed. And the tea went flying. <laughs> and he goes, those musicians, those pure musicians, those pure... It's I'm at the studio and I went, Mick, Mick, it's Sunday. And he went, oh. <laughs> so it was that, it was that sort of strung up on it, you know. Um, but then when he went there, he went down to the string players and, he, and they were like, we were dressed like we were dressed and they were like, we were scum. Do you know what I mean? They shouldn't really be there. And he just walked in front of them and rolled a cigarette. You know, they were on like, we want to get on with it and he just rolled a ciggy and took his time and rolled it. Went, you all right? You know, and just rolled this cig. <laughs> And then he got them to play it, and you could see him going, this is their first take, and they were going... And usually they did one take, and they'd got it right. It was a right part. Uh, and the leader of the guys came and said, we'd, we'd like to do another one. We think we can do it with more feel. And the engineers in Trident just went, that's never happened before. <laughs> you know, they do one take, and when they get it right, they're out the door, you know. <laughs> And they wanted to do it again, so we went, do it again. That's it. What was the moment that you realised that Ziggy Stardust was going to be a success and you were, you know, you were famous? Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, was it that top uh, of the pops? Yeah, probably. You know, you, we'd heard changes on the radio, so that when you when the red when a track's on the radio, you're woo, you know, <laughs> that's nice. Um, and then probably yeah, doing top of the pops. We'd um, we used to go shopping in Beckenham for our food shopping and that. Um, and after doing top of the pops, we went out shopping. And he'd go in a shop and they'd go, mm, "We saw you on the telly." Um, and he'd go, "How much?" And they go, "Oh, nothing." And he'd go, "No, how much? We've got this, this, that. Oh, nothing." And every shop we went in, nobody charged us. I was like, hey, this is cool. <laughs> Let's try a clothes shop. It didn't work in there. <laughs> but, um, and then you couldn't go shopping. You'd go down Oxford Street and you spend, I would spend an hour and a half signing autographs. So you didn't get your shopping done, you know. On the uh, Ziggy Stardust album, um, there's a drum intro to the beginning of the album. And Graham, I don't know if Graham's here, he emailed me and asked me to ask you um, uh, how that drum beat came about. Like that. <laughs> no, um, I, probably it was just hearing that track, and it was it was a depressing subject. Really, it was the end of the world, and um, I'd worked with Mick on it, um, and it was like find one that 
just like it sets the mood really sets the mood up for the track to come in so I remember thinking you can't kind of do loads of fills because if it's the end of the world you're not going to be that excited <laughs> do you know what I mean you're not going to do much and I remember when I was playing it I was going you know going shall I go for that symbol or shall I I can't be bothered. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you kind of got right into the... I mean, a lot of it was... His his songs are very um, communicative. They really set a mood. And if, you, if you're willing to go in there and get in it, you it's a pleasure to get depressed <laughs> by the song. You, you know, because you yeah. know it's not you. You know it's not real, but you you can go in there, and, and we did that as a band, really. Um, Should we get like that? like a Ziggy Stardust? He, he he kind of became Ziggy Stardust, but behind him were three Yorkshire guys. That this might sound a bit freaky, but we thought we were from Mars. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? You went out there as. Not an not an earthly band, especially not Yorkshire. Mm. Um, you you back that up. You had to become that to pull it off, uh, to make it real, to make it convincing. Because yeah. really, as as a as any kind of a any kind of a job, really. But it's like how it's not BS. But it's like how well can you convince other people that that's what you are is the game yeah I know that's a bit deep but no, 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 that's good. <laughs> you know so to pull off those tracks dressed like that <laughs> with the lights and the whole choreography that we got into and everything um, you had to be believable so you were you were to have that authenticity yeah you had yeah. to act it you had to be it and that you know when we when we first went out gigging, they used to sh- they used to throw ca- uh, beer bottles while we played, and, and other objects and that, and I would be ducking things, bouncing off the cymbals, and it was dangerous because they'd not seen anything like that. Mind you, it was in pubs, <laughs> but uh, still they didn't it, they couldn't handle it, um, and then we realised that we were going out there going, I hope they like it. I hope it goes down well. And then we went, that's not the right attitude. It's like, you will like it. You know, it's a different attitude. You're not hoping, you don't need a license. You don't need a okay for them to, to, to be a musician and play and entertain. You do it. Um, and we kind of put that in. It's like, we knew it was good. Getting big headed now, yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think uh, Mars is easier to get to than Hull, anyway, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it says Mars Leeds. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think it's twinned. Um, but should we get depressed together and listen to uh, beginning of five years? Depressed, yeah. Thoroughly. Thoroughly. So the, the next album you did was um, Aladdin Sane, which you know you could describe as uh, Ziggy Stardust in America with pianos. <laughs> you could, you yeah. could, yeah. But it was quite different, wasn't it? Because the four of you were joined by um, you know quite a number of other musicians, um, not least Mike Garson, the pianist. Yeah, I didn't really notice the others. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah. Did that did that change things? Change the dynamic between you or not really? Because we, uh, it was just the spiders were that band that was on there, and and Mike was really a, an American jazz guy. That we you know we appreciated his playing, brilliant playing, but it it, it, it was always kind of the four, so that that core thing was there. It was only really during those last tours. I mean, we worked, I think we had three weeks off in a year. And sometimes we did, like in San Francisco and other places, you'd do a Saturday afternoon matinee. So you did two o'clock show and then a night show as well. And you did that for a week and then you did that somewhere else. So we were like always playing or doing a TV thing or whatever. Um, And I noticed 
even then, you know, when, when they wanted to interview David, they didn't really want to speak to David Jones. Do you know what I mean? They, what they actually wanted was, I want to talk to, I want to interview Ziggy Stardust. So he would, he would um, comply with that, and he would be that persona that he was on stage in an interview, um, which was quite... Um, intimidating, quite powerful, the way he kind of created it. There was four trapdoors in the stage, and uh, I said, oh, it would be wicked if we come up from the trapdoors. So we had the clockwork orange music playing, and then we put a different colour on each, above each trapdoor, and we just came, and it came up really slowly, and we just came up mm-hmm. like that with the clockwork, <laughs> and it, the place went absolutely bonkers. Um, but we'd just had a fight about something, probably whether I would wear a jacket or something or that he wanted me to wear, and I said no. Um, but then when he got on stage, it was always gone. You know, you always just played, because that's what you were there for. You know. So your relationship did cool over, over a period of time with him? Towards um, the end, Towards yeah. the end. Yeah. I mean, what, what was the real cause of that? I mean... It, Maybe this, you know, this schizophrenia the schizophrenia around Ziggy. No. The jacket. It was a <laughs> <laughs> but it, it culminated, didn't it, with, with you effectively being sacked on stage at yeah. um, <laughs> Hammersmith Odin in, in 1973. Uh, that I'm, sounds really good. I've never heard it sound like that before. Haven't you? Yeah, uh, no. Yeah. Um, which is the film that um, is being shown later here. At the ICM I can watch my own sacking, that's good. <laughs> um, We'd, you know, we'd talked a lot about what we were going to do in the future, and he'd gone into he'd gone into the soul thing, which I didn't like. Um, didn't see myself doing it particularly. Um, I just I liked things based in rock. Um, some commercial things he was talking about that I didn't like. Uh, so it, it had started to break down a little bit and then it was like, and I want you to wear, I want you to not kind of be featured as a band and blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And it, it just didn't seem as appealing. So we'd already had, you know, the seeds of that were already sown. And there were, there were, fin- <laughs> there were financial things that, um, that were not quite right with his management. And um, I didn't really hit it off with his, his manager at the time. Um, and I do have a mouth sometimes, uh, occasionally, um, which didn't put me in good stead. I said what we all wanted to say, basically. Um, yeah. How do you feel about it now? And, and your, I mean, have you had any contact with him? <laughs> um, I've been in contact with him recently. Um, totally cool, you know. Um, we're uh, we've been asked. Trevor and I have been asked to put uh, four gigs at Hammersmith together. Would we do Ziggy at Hammersmith? Great. When will that be? April in April. And our, our idea is to pull in. There was there was a lot of over the years. I've met lots of singers and bands that got together and through that album had a seen it live or listening to the album like like Chad Smith from the Chili Peppers said I learnt drums playing Ziggy you know when I learnt Ziggy I could play drums um, what's his name from the Eurythmics Dave Stewart said I thought well if three guys from Yorkshire can make it I can <laughs> Especially doing that, you know. And you so said, the, "What we're, we're from the, Mars?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, just a lot that started music because of that that period. Um, so we thought, why don't we get those people that are around now that are at the top doing their careers and get them to sing it or play it? So we've got a few lined up already that. Oh, names that want to do it. Great, we have an exclusive. Spiders from Mars next April, is it? Yeah, Actually. next April. April. Actually, how's with Odeon? Um, I'm going to um, 
mention the names of a few people you've worked with or met in the past, and I just want off the top of your head. I thought you were going to ask me why I thought why I thought it was still being talked about forty years on. I am. Are you? I'm going to do this first. Is that next? Go on. <laughs> yeah. So you don't know that this is going to happen, but you have to think of one word for these people, okay? Straight you know, off the top got, of your head. On a Friday, I've got Tourette's syndrome. You have. You know, okay. <laughs> Let, let's start gently and, and lead into it. Okay, uh, Trevor Boulder. Great bass player, nice guy, good friend. It's one word. <laughs> oh, one word? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, they all joined right. up, it's like one. Yeah, no, fair enough. Mick Ronson. Friend. Iggy Pop. Amazing. Andy Warhol. Bizarre. Okay, that's good, that works. I need a couple more, bear with me, bear with me. Uh, Jeff Beck. Incredible. And uh, David Bowie. Genius. There we go. That's good. Um, I mean, there's a whole, as you said, there's a whole generation of musicians who, uh, for whom Ziggy was an inspiration. So that a lot of the punk, new wave, new romantic eras. I mean, it's hard not to look at um, Johnny Rotten with his ginger hair and not think of him as Ziggy's bastard son. Well, I do anyway. So, uh, uh, well, Glenn's here. We... <laughs> He's not did with ever, me. Did you ever think He's like not that? with me, Glenn. <laughs> not with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it? All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. We could just see the beginning of one of Glenn's songs and see the sort of causal link in the five years between the two. Um, we've got Pretty Vacant. There are two other songs I just want to play, Woody, that I think um, exemplify your, your playing style. Um, and it's going to be embarrassing, no? The laughing, you weren't on The Laughing Gnome, were you? No. no. First one is... Um, the rock version. The, yeah. yeah. First one is uh, John, I'm Only Dancing. And then uh, from Ziggy Stardust, Star. Do you think you'll ever, ever play with Bowie again? Don't know, actually. Now that we're kind of talking <laughs> I don't know what he's doing to be honest I don't know whether he um, he's kind of in a, a, a semi uh, retirement um, well earned um, I heard he was painting I sent a message to um, Tony Visconti who was his producer on his last album said just tell him we need some more good stuff out here see if that but I didn't get a response, so I don't know. Possibly. Uh, have you ever thought, uh, you know, over the last 40 years and after you stopped working with him, that you never ever want to hear about Ziggy Stardust again? Only after maybe three months of interviews, <laughs> yeah. You know, you go, <laughs> you know, you know, I'm up to it. Um, but it's, it's fond memories, you know, it was, uh, it was, it's quite amazing you know, you heard some of the tracks in the studio when Ken Scott finished mixing them, like Life on Mars or something, and you went, whoa, is that too far? You know, it was so radical to what was going around at the time. You just thought, will people like it? Will they get it? You know, and then to think 40 years on, it still played on the radio. And, and I was on the Olympics with six tracks. I mean, I wanted to be an athlete when I was at school. I had a choice. At one point, I was thinking athlete, musician, and Olympics came up, and I got on to be. The, I got to do the Olympics, so that was good. Mm -hmm. um, How did you feel about that bit, um, that that it, Bowie piece they did at the opening? It was great. I thought it was brilliant. Um, what was I saying? Um, <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm proud of those albums. Do you know what I mean? They, um, I probably did, I probably didn't look at it like that at the time, but um, you know you set off to be a, a musician, and you you kind of doing it for a reason. You know you enjoy doing it. You like the effect. You like creating effects, and you kind of hope that it's pleasurable and that it's entertaining and. Uh, all the rest of the things that music can do. So you hope you're doing it and you're doing your best to do that. You know, when you look back, you think, okay, well, it, it kind of must have done that. 
you know, it must have uh, entertained and inspired. And so you're proud of that, you know. And then you start looking and you think, well, really, that's what art's supposed to do. That's what music's supposed to do. Um, it's just gone in. You know, it's probably a similar period now that it was in the 70s. You know, you've got X Factor and The Voice and Big Brother and Boo there and, and that <laughs> stuff, which I really can't... I just find that degrading. Um, it's like, can we find another angle to degrade human beings while other human beings sit and watch it? You know, it's like the Roman amphitheatre, you know what I mean? Um but a modern version. So I think art has a responsibility, and artists have that. It's their job to create stuff that does lift up a country, or, or, or athletes do that. Look, it, it felt different when the Olympics were on. It just in, Even in my village in Sussex, people talked more. I had more conversations in the garage. It was, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and if you think, if you've got like, 50 great bands or whatever touring a country then you know when you've been to a gig you can be up on that for a week or a month you know you you it lifts you up you're up if you have 50 doing that then it lifts a country and blah, 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 blah. and and it's it just ex, if that was expanded then the culture and everything else comes when you're up you know, you don't you don't write good stuff or create good music from a hard work, um, serious. It's an effort viewpoint. You don't do it from that. You don't get the art in. You, the, the the aesthetics and the art is not available to you when you're serious. You know, you have to be like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> not quite that you have to do a good job and you apply what you've learned but you, you, you have to have fun you have to enjoy doing it and you have to enjoy it and, and know that it you get that when it's fun and you're having a good time and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing which is back to what art is supposed to do and what music's supposed to do so I'm glad that it's still around now because it kind of up when at the end of the day, when you're dead, all you leave behind is what you what you created as an artist. That's what you've left behind, you know. So to leave it on a de- depressing note, <laughs> <laughs> back to five years. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> but, uh, but what, what are you working on at the moment? How to depress more people? Um, <laughs> I'm work. I'm four tracks into an album. I, I, I used to write. 20 odd years ago I kind of started writing and then I got so that I would only write when people asked me to write or that's what happened they'd say can you oh yeah can you write this and blah, blah. and then I realised I never wrote because I enjoy writing which is where I really started so I went right I'm going to write again and if they never leave the living room I enjoy it you know, that would be the right viewpoint. And in a week, I was in the studio. I'd met this guy who said, have you got any songs? And I went, well, there's then. He went, I want to do that. So then I've, I've been writing for about a year and I've thrown out about 40. And um, and I've got quite a few that are turning out quite good. So I've got Trevor. Trevor's playing bass on four of the tracks on Monday we start. So that's the first time we've actually recorded anything new together as a rhythm section. So that's quite exciting. Great. Does anyone have any questions? First of all, I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Especially about the air raid shelter and stuff about the rats. You know, I've never about going back to Yorkshire for one. I'm really sure about that. I've written down a question if you want to get this right. Um... It seems that Ken Scott was somewhat responsible for the running order of the Oh. Hi. Yeah. Seems that Ken Scott was responsible for the running order of Ziggy. Um, so, given that haphazard selection of the running order and perhaps the concept to an extent, once the whole hoopla and momentum of 72 really got going, and Ziggy, as you've said, was made flesh with a real living, breathing 
alien rocker sat next to you in the car, David Ziggy. How did he present this to you guys the rest of the time? Because to a certain extent, you know, you were sometimes still there living on, you know, the landing in Haddon Hall. And I know that in towards the end of 73, he was up in London, Cheney Walk and that sort of thing. But there was a time when he was hugely popular and the Ziggy thing had really got going. But I know, because I was up there, that you were all still living in Haddon Hall on Tuesday afternoons when you hadn't got a gig for a few days. But it, was he really sat there in the kitchen giving you the, the same cold David Ziggy that he gave you in the car? And also... Could you please describe anything you can in as much detail about the main man office and what it was like? Did you ever go there? Hey, that's at least two questions. Okay, let, yeah, go on. So, so the, the, the Ziggy off stage at Haddon Hall, and could you just tell me anything if you ever went there about the main man office and Tony DeFries and, you know, the people there. We know bits, but just something that perhaps we, we don't know. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I haven't done anything yet. Um... <laughs> No, it was only in the tail end of touring where where the, the Ziggy thing really took over. You know, because we, you know, on the first tours and that, you know, we'd come off stage. Uh, we we never could have kind of hang, hung around. We usually shot off back to the hotel and then we'd party or go out to a club. Um, so it was that was just like it was in the beginning. Um yeah, we, we slept for the first probably year and a half. Mick and I had sleeping bags on his landing. I mean, the, the house was, it was like that staircase in Wind in the Willows. It had a staircase exactly like that, and it went round, the banisters went round that way, but all the doors around that way were all blocked off. There were other flats at the other side, and we had two sleeping bags up there. David had a bedroom with Angie downstairs, and I think Tony Visconti had a bedroom. Um, it was kind of the... I always look at it like it's the, It's part of the adventure. At the time, it's like it's hard on your bones, yeah? But when you look back, you go, that was part of it. You know, that was part of the... Are we going to do it? Um, it's the adventure... You know, it's almost an anti-climax when you're successful, to some degree. Yeah. You you've done it. That that game of making it has gone. So you've you, to some degree you've lost. Does that make sense? You've lost something because you've 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 won that bit. Um, so when you look back, it's the adventure of the even the crap that you <laughs> that you went through at times is was part of the adventure. It was part of what got you there. Um, and you look back with fond memories on it. Um, I don't think, oh, God, we slept in a sleeping bag. We only made that much a week. And, you know, we, we, I mean, I went from a kind of a £40 a week job to £7. Mick got £7. I got £7. We had enough for uh, tobacco and a couple of glasses of lager. And that was about it. But we were playing and we were rehearsing and we were writing, not writing, but practicing. And um, and that was what was important. You know, that was that was the game we'd chosen. Um, the main man office was uh, in Fulham. And it was just an office, basically, with a Chesterfield, a couple of Chesterfields in it. Um, just a boring office, really. <laughs> De Vries was probably what I, I imagine um, Elvis's manager was like. Not a lot of uh, genuine concern for people. But a genuine... <laughs> money driven um, good business he, he knew how to get what he wanted out of record companies and things like that do you think David allowed himself to be pushed along and manipulated you know like traded I, off the I way? think I think David was probably 
that desperate out of, after all the tracks that he'd released that he was at a point where whatever you know and and so the the deals that he did were not in his best interests and oh, he well, didn't and he didn't and he didn't really know that until Ziggy made it and then realized that it wasn't fascinating it. thank you very much thank you thank you any other questions yep the little um, <laughs> don't really need that <laughs> Oh, you pretty things, the little drum turnaround in the middle. Yeah. It's my favourite bit of drum. It makes me smile every time that I hear it. Did you, does that come from the library or was that an inspired moment? And can you remember when that happened and how it happened? That's an impossible uh, question, really. Do you remember the moment that when you did the and thought, yeah, did yeah. go, yeah, that's good? Can't answer you. <laughs> it's probably the library. Lost in the library somewhere. Got any other questions, please? Oh, thank you. Um, there's been talk of a musical for like the uh, that time, the Ziggy Stardust time, yeah. and um, it got waylaid along the line, along the way. Is there anybody thinking about probably producing a musical of like the Ziggy Stardust at a time? Would you be interested in it? In helping the production, yeah, I would actually. That I I actually only heard about it a week and a half ago. So you'd be interested. <laughs> <laughs> Who's <was> asking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I've got a venue anyway, and I'm working on it. Are you if really you're interested? Yeah, give my card. Yeah. We can talk afterwards I, about it. I have that. it on a list at home, actually. <laughs> yeah, Glenn? I was just interested in you saying you were going off and buying my bitch with a band around Murray. Did that happen quite a lot? And who sang it? The same guy that sang that first track that you played, a guy called Benny Marshall. Right. Um, it's just kind of funny that Bowie's sort of letting his babies go out not out of his control. It's, it's just a bit kind of weird somewhere. I wouldn't have thought he would have done that. But obviously he did. He gave Peter Noon one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a song. That was a... I don't think he understood it, but... <laughs> yeah. yeah. After your... Um, uh, as mentioned earlier, your public sacking on the last Iggy Stardust concert. Um, did your drumsticks actually hit Bowie? And what was the first thing you said when you came off stage? <laughs> <laughs> and we're all adults. <coughs> I'm thinking about this one. Because um. you did say that you threw your drumsticks at Bowie. You can see on the film that drumsticks go up, whether it actually hit him. No, it didn't. But I'm more intrigued as <laughs> what you said when you walked off. It didn't hit him. I did throw one, but not with not with malice. No, no. Because was there was there sort of animosity as soon as you walked off the stage? So obviously, with Ziggy Stardust with the tour, he was getting more separated. Did did you walk off? That was it then. Uh, I guess for Trevor and I, we were the only two that didn't know. Because that was brought out with um, a recent documentary, which I didn't realise. Yeah. Because it caused a lot of problems after both of you. But yeah. Um, I mean, you have to understand. David was very much a in the moment creative artist. If he saw something that would create an effect and it would be to his advantage, he would do it, he would use it, he would play it, he would strum it, he would stroke whatever it was. That's that's kind of how he was. So, you know, when he announced that, it it was just another announcement to us at the time. It was really Oh, that's a good one. You know, like, is this a total withdrawal from the audience when we're at the peak to then make the audience come to you type? That's what went through our heads. Um, and it was really... So then we, we kind of chatted afterwards and it was like, yeah. And then everybody was saying, yeah, we think that's it. We think that's it. We're not doing the Ziggy thing anymore. Blah, 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 blah. And we were like... But then we were, we'd already discussed what we were doing next. So we were doing um, pinups was the next thing. And we were all like lined up to go to France. So it kind of didn't compute. 
it was like, okay, is the end of the Ziggy thing, and then pinups was just like a. He was that. He'd been. We'd been that busy. He hadn't written, and that was, from my viewpoint, just a. He, he laid that on the band and said the band always wanted to do these sixties covers, when well, we didn't. Didn't do you know what I mean? That was a. Uh, a way of doing an album that was probably a commitment to the record company and it was an easy way of doing it. So we were all going to do that and then I, I just got... <laughs> I'd, I was getting married about three days after that tour and um, and I got a call ten minutes after I um, got married, basically. And uh, it was De Vries, and he just said... Uh, you won't be going to France. And blah, 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 blah. And that was it. So that was the real... Are you still look back with Brian, then? Well, on the music and that. Yeah, yeah totally. Thanks very much. Yeah. Woody's going to uh, go out for a fag, and then he's available to sign, uh, to meet people and to sign uh, the very nice Bowie Fest posters we're selling at the ICA. And he still didn't answer me the question. Why did, I think, why did I think it was still around and still being liked now and played now? Oh, yeah. You didn't ask me. Do you, want, do you want to end on that? No, not really. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what. I think, for a lot of reasons, the time, you know, that something like that that was like an escape, and it was good good music, genius songs, a good, um, a good concept that was believable, was needed at the time, you know. Uh, good arrangements... And Ken Scott played a, lot, a big part in it. He actually didn't pick the order of the tracks on the album. Um, but his, but his, having worked with the Beatles as, as his apprenticeship, he, he knew how to create sounds that went together and how to mix it and balance it so that it sounded with a quality that I think it gave it the timelessness. I think he put that into it. You know, yeah, genius songs and everything else, but that that production from that viewpoint of the the sounds themselves it somehow made it timeless and and good tracks play that that have that about them. They they just continue down the years. You hear them on the you know whether it's Baker Street or you know they they just pop up. They're always there. They've got that something special. And part of it is is that sound that's created that that is of a certain quality that's timeless. Finished. <laughs> Woody Wimsey, thank you very much. <laughs>